Louise Gray uh, is a freelance environmental writer. She spent five years as a writer at the Daily Telegraph and has also worked for the BBC, The Guardian, The Sunday Times, Country Life, The Spectator, and Scottish Field. She's the author of the award-winning book, The Ethical Carnivore, which I read. It's really good. Uh, where she discusses the ethics of meat by only eating animals she has killed herself. Today, Louise will be telling us about the focus of her new book, Avocado Anxiety. Again, I read this book. It's really, I would really advise all of you to um, buy that and read it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so she, what she's doing in this book is uh, she's sharing um, uh, the stories behind uh, the favorite fresh fruit and vegetables, okay? And uh, also trying to explore why nothing is ever so perfect, <laughs> okay? So at the end of Louis' talk, um, we will um, take questions from the audience. Um, over to you, Louis. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to uh, start with um, a presentation on my book so that you um, have an idea of the themes and then we can open up to discussion because um, this is definitely a debate, an ongoing debate in our society where we get our food from. So anyone suffer from anxiety when they, when they go shopping, when they're in the supermarket? Nodding a few heads, yeah, yeah. So that's not surprising because more than a third of our greenhouse gases, man-made greenhouse gases, are from the food system. And obviously, um, there, is a, there is a climate crisis. And um, so we want to be doing something about our greenhouse gases from the, from, from, from the food system. And in my last book, I looked at meat. Um, and we, we do need to eat less meat as a global population. So the next question for me was, what about our fruit and vegetables? Where do they come from, and what impact are they having on the environment? And a natural place for me to start was my own family roots, because my great-grandfather was a greengrocer. And he owned um, a chain of um, greengrocers called Rankins in Edinburgh. And it was quite a special place. I put some photos in the blog, and people got back to me, and they remembered you know, going in for a coconut or some dates. And they made beautiful fruit baskets with grapes, because um, exotic fruit and vegetables were a real treat back then. And there was no self-service. Uh, everything was seasonal. There was no plastic. It was a different experience um, shopping uh, for, for your fruit and veg. But now, of course, we have supermarkets. And uh, Rankin's sadly closed in the 1980s. And really, that's happened all over the country. It used to be the case that we would get 80% of our fruit and veg from Green, from grocers in the um, you know in our um, in our towns and cities from the high street. Now it's the other way around. We get eighty percent from supermarkets, and um, I don't think that's going away. I think we can talk about later about how we might be able to um, free ourselves a little from the supermarket system. Um, but in the book, I decided to trace our fruit and veg from supermarkets because I feel that's most useful to you. That's where where things are. And the first thing I wanted to look I looked at was potatoes. In each chapter, um, and one thing about fruit and vegetables, I feel they've got personality, they've got character. And um, so each one I try to link to a theme. And potatoes, I started looking at soil. And it was very hard to stop writing. The soil is fascinating. Potatoes are a particularly intensive crop for our soils. Um, we're actually sort of at the north <coughs> side of the fens, which is where we grow most, well, 40% of our fruit and veg in this country is from the fens. It's the best agricultural land in Britain but it is degrading. We're losing two centimetres a year um, of peat, and that's a huge amount of carbon as well, and fertility. So we need to, we need to start protecting that. And on a global um, level, um, in, in the same way, we're degrading our soils. And there have been studies that said we've got less than 100 harvests left, less than 100 years. Some people would say less, some people more. I interviewed the scientist about that. It's a hard thing to put a figure on, but certainly our, our soils are degrading. And we need to be farming in a different way. And in the UK, they are. In the book, I visit um, potato farmers. And they're using um, GPS a lot more so that you can, you can look over a field and see where the fertilizer is needed, where the pesticides are needed, and then um, just apply it where it's needed rather than um, all over the field, adding green waste and making the rotations a lot longer. Um, I did consider organic. 
and there is more biodiversity on organic farm, farms, certainly. But regenerative farming, agroecological farming, even what some people might call conventional farming, can still uh, look after our soil. I think all farming should look after our soil. So really, everything comes down to the soil. But that was just one chart. Um, the next thing I looked at was wildlife on our farms, because other than um, the carbon impact of our food, the other massive impact is on wildlife. Um, we've lost a huge amount of biodiversity in, in my lifetime. I'm waiting for the figure, but I think we know, like, we leave it 50% of farmland birds in my lifetime, you know? And again, that comes back to our food production. So I looked at uh, organic, uh, linking environment and farming, um, and um, organic certainly. Um, leads to more biodiversity on farms. Linking environment and farming, which allows for some chemical use, but still allowing for wildlife. And I went and visited farms where nightingales are coming back. And that's, this is an intensive farm where a lot of our, our salad is grown, but they've been putting in more hedges. They've been putting in um, uh, uh, ditches that bring wildlife back. So we can farm in a way that helps wildlife. And I think one of my conclusions was we need um, a combination of things. You need agroecological farms or organic farms for species like skylarks that require um, a, um, a farming rotation. You know, they need, they need hay meadows, they need grass. But intensive farming allows us to eat food quite cheaply. And if you're farming well intensively, you can then rewild other parts of the land. So I think it's about a mosaic, um, lift different, different ways of farming across the, U across the UK. Um, I'm just going to go, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I've gone, I'm going to go back, sorry. Uh, the other thing was tomatoes, because chem um, chemical use, we use three million tonnes of chemicals every year, and I went to see how tomatoes are produced inside uh, greenhouses in the UK, and instead of using chemicals, well, first of all, the, the tomatoes have to be pollinated, and the way we pollinate them is bumblebees. So you introduce bumblebees into the greenhouses. It's all greenhouses with tomatoes in the UK. Um, and once you introduce the, 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 the bumblebees, you can't use pesticides because you kill your pollinators. So then how do you get rid of the aphids? Well, they introduce uh, spider mites that eat the aphids. It's called biocontrol. It's a new area of science. They've even got bees called flying doctors. And when they come out the hive, they get a little bit of fungicide. And then they go and uh, pollinate the plants and also add fungicides. So it's, inter it's interesting how, um, how, how, in how, we, how we can reduce chemicals. And that is influencing farmers um, outside of greenhouses. For example, again, having more, having more um, wider verges around the fields means that there's more, um, there's more beetles and ladybirds that then will eat the pests. Um, but it, uh, we'll get onto the complexities because. But uh, one a question is, you know, tomatoes from the UK are more um, using more energy. You actually, tomatoes from Spain will have a lower carbon footprint because even though they've been trucked in from Spain, they haven't been in a heated um, greenhouse. But the ones from Spain use more plastic. You, they use more water. So there's no way around this conversation or the complexities involved. And the huge part of that, like I just mentioned, is how far it's travelled. So food miles um, is something you perhaps heard of. It came about, about 20 years ago. We started to talk about food miles because people started noticing green beans from Kenya on the shelves at this time of year where you can buy UK green beans with a little aeroplane on them. And they've got a really heavy carbon footprint, the 15 kilograms per kilogram of produce, whereas a green bean grown in the UK would be 0.15. So if you want to reduce the carbon footprint of your shopping basket, you want to avoid air freight. But <laughs> um, first of all, I think you should understand that's just, the shopping, that's just the carbon footprint of your shopping basket. It really pales <laughs> in comparison that if you're going to take a short haul flight. So it would take 420 packs of green beans, um, uh, the carbon footprint, for one return flight to Barcelona, or if you drove to the supermarket, perhaps. So, um, 
so in terms of your carbon footprint, it's worth thinking about, but overall, um, it's, it's relatively small. And the other question is, if those green beans are being grown in Kenya, they might be supporting, they are supporting, potentially, an export market that is helping a lot of Kenyans to um, develop economically, allowing them to send their children to school. And the British government actually supports export horticulture in places like Kenya to, uh, to help to aid development. And uh, Oxfam, big charities also support it. So it, I don't think, I think you should look out for the air freight to reduce your carbon footprint. But occasionally, you know, maybe it's, it also might be supporting someone in another country. So does seasonality matter? Well, I was talking to um, Samathia about this before. Like a strawberry right now tastes great, right? Because it's summer and you have all these memories of eating strawberries in summer. And it might have been grown outside. You might have picked it yourself. And I think it's a wonderful thing about seasonality. It connects you to the landscape and the farmers and the seasons. And that's so important. So we shouldn't lose sight of that. At the same time, most strawberries are grown like this in polytunnels from May to September in the UK in the same way. And I don't think it's a bad thing that we can produce this beautiful, delicious fruit over a wider season. Children love it. And it's going to have the same impact on the environment. So seasonality does matter, but don't beat yourself up about a strawberry in September. Um, so after meat, reducing the amount of meat we eat, which I address in my first book, the next thing that has a really massive impact on the carbon footprint of our food is food waste. 10% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, are from food waste. If it were a country, after the US and China, it would have, it would be, food waste would be the biggest producer of, of, of carbon emissions. And we, we are part of that. So, for, like, we all uh, attack the supermarkets, and they are to blame in the fact that they refuse things like wonky carrots for no reason, even though the wonky carrots taste exactly the same. And there are, um, but 70% of food waste in the UK, in developed countries, is, is in our own homes. So we can start to plan our meals better. We can use up leftovers. Um, we, can, we can reduce food waste at home. And then after that, we can start uh, recycling food waste, either by feeding it to animals, um, feeding it to pigs, which doesn't happen in this country because of the law. But interestingly, what is happening is insects fed on food waste. And then those black soldier ants are made into a protein that is fed to animals. So it's another way of reusing our food waste and making sure it doesn't go to waste. Um, and lastly, through putting it in the food bin. Um, in, in Wales, 100% of people use their food bins. And it, use, um, and it goes to an anaerobic digester, and it makes methane, which is um, a renewable, uh, which is a gas, which can produce energy. Um, and in, the, in England, in certain areas of England, it's been introduced, but people don't use them. And I just think that's crazy. Like, we need to sort of call that a bit. You know, it's not. It, it, it's a little bit like in the past, people would throw glass in the bin, and now you would balk at it because it's, it, it's a relatively easy thing to recycle, and food is a, a form of energy. Um, the next question I look at, well, the next chapter is bananas. And bananas are such a fascinating story. And I remember writing about it, interviewing a scientist in, um, in the Netherlands, um, Fernando Garcia Bastidas. He's a really eccentric guy. He's just had a kid and he showed me, he sent me a picture recently of his baby dressed up as a banana. He's very passionate, but he is, he is developed, uh, uh, the, the history of bananas very quickly is we started farming bananas in South America at the turn of the last century by cutting down rainforests and creating a monoculture. And then we realized they would cycle from green to yellow in seven days. So then, you know, big refrigerated chips and it was the first fruit or vegetable to really uh, be commoditized, like to be, to, to fit into the capitalist system. And within a few years, it was the most popular fruit in America. And it's still the most popular fruit in the UK, in America, in Europe. It's so cheap, but it's had a massive impact on the environment and continues to because it's a monoculture. So if w one banana gets sick, they all get sick. So you have to use a lot of chemicals. And at the moment, there is a pandemic in bananas uh, a little bit similar to our pandemic that could wipe them out. And there are scientists working towards um, new varieties 
but they don't want just one variety. We need more varieties um, of bananas and other fruits and vegetables because it means we can use less chemicals um, and it's better for us. Um, someone said to me, uh, if you ask a difficult question, the answer is always diversity. <laughs> but um, the, the, also how people are treated on banana plantations. And I would urge people to look at fair trade bananas. It's three pounds extra a year to buy fair trade bananas, but you know that people have been treated well. Like I said, diversity matters. And the chapter where I look at diversity is the apple chapter. Um, I think we rely on 75% of what we eat comes from nine crops, you know, potatoes, rice, maize. But we, as humans, can eat 6,000 crops. And it's not good for us. It's better for our gut health. It's better for our overall health and the environment, as well as better for um, science and technology, because we can develop um, new species that are, that are helpful to us and our farming system to have diversity. And I use the example of apples, because we only eat five varieties of apples, but we've got 2,500 varieties of apples in the UK. And I don't think there's anything wrong in eating raw gala. I, I love them. They're my favorite. Um, but when these apples are in season in the UK, by eating them, you're supporting, you're keeping orchards alive where there are rare species, and you're keeping diversity alive that may come in useful in the future. In Kent at the moment, they're looking at um, apples for climate change, so apples that might survive um, in the heat, at, you know, 40 degree heat, which is what they're seeing in Kent every year now. So diversity is really important. Um, to go back to climate, ch to, to carbon um, and meat, if we replace meat with plant protein, it, it's, it helps because meat has a, a car um, things like beans have a lower carbon footprint. But they also do something pretty amazing, and they fix nitrogen in the soil, legumes. So if a farmer has a, has a rotation with raw beans, you're bringing, you can have you, ha you don't need to use art um, artificial fertilizer for that rotation because you're fixing nitrogen, the, the plants fix nitrogen in the soil. And they're even now just mixing beans and crop legumes through other crops so that there's less artificial fertilizer used. And again, it's really good for us. I get quite, I mean, there are people at the UN whose job it is just to get us all eating more beans and pulses. It's a great, it's, there are a few answers in life, but pulses is one of them. Um, and at the beginning of the book, again, I was saying to Samathia, who grows her own much better than me, I thought I would, like, grow all my own fruit and vegetables and take you all through it. Um, I wasn't that good. I grew a few, and I enjoyed it very much. But what came out of it for me was really mental health benefits, because I just love being down at the allotment, seeing the wildlife, making friends. And there's been really interesting studies showing what foraging and gardening can do for mental health. And I feel like having more allotments in cities would do so much for us in terms of people learning where their fruit and veg come from, in, uh, in accessing uh, affordable fruit and vegetables, and um, in air quality. And we could, we could also be producing more of our food. Studies have been done, like, um, at the moment, in the UK, we import 80%, uh, over 80% of our fruit and just under 50% of our vegetables, but we could be producing much more here. And that's not jingoistic, that's, that's just about security. We could be producing more, and um, producing food in cities is something we can do on rooftops, um, uh, underground with LED, and just using different spaces and, and having more allotments. So uh, um, there are studies found like we could, up to 10% of our fruit and vegetables could come from from cities, from where we live. And cities are always like um, the shambles in York is from the um, Anglo-Saxon word for meat shelves because that's where you bought your meat. So, you know, we used to have, we used to have food in our cities. Um, perhaps we should go back to that. And I've al al already mentioned LED lights. This is me pregnant, not fat, by the way. <laughs> um, the, um, LED lights, um, there, there's a new way of producing, producing food. We could be producing more in cities with technology. But I don't think it's realistic that we, there was something called the Fife diet or the 100-mile diet, getting 80% of our fruit and vegetables from within 100 miles and then 20%. Um, and 
it's a nice idea, and I would urge people to eat local and seasonal, but it's pretty hard, you know, if you're running home from work and you need to bang on, bung on pasta and pesto for your kids, you know, it, it's a hard thing to do. But, I, but te technology will help us um, to have a, more, have a more resilient food system and have a, um, a lighter footprint on, the, footprint on the planet, which is what we need to do if we want to have the biodiversity and we want to tackle climate change. Um, so the conclusion of the book <laughs> is about avocados. Um, avocados don't have that heavier carbon footprint. It's only 1.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide per uh, kilogram produced, which is, is more than potatoes and carrots, but it's a lot less than beef. I got booed recently because I did this at a, to farmers, and they, they are feeling threatened. It's something to consider, you know, like um, by people eating less meat. But the fact is that avocados are, are, the carbon footprint isn't a worry. Water is more of a worry because they are being grown in countries like Chile, Spain, Morocco, where there is their water stressed and the waters are coming from aquifers which can't be refilled. But a lot of them are from Kenya, Colombia, places where there's a lot of water coming from the sky and they're grown on trees. So avocados aren't necessarily a bad thing for the environment. There are human rights implications in places like Mexico because um, organized crime has moved into avocado plantations and uh, people who farm avocados are having to pay, um, pay towards organized crime. But I don't think boycotting is going to help people with that. It's um, supporting Mexican farmers to uh, protect themselves. So avocados aren't perfect, but that's kind of where the book comes back to. Is you, you, it's good to feel interested and know where our fruit is from, but anxiety, I think, doesn't help. I talk about, e I've written about eating disorders and bulimia and um, in my own experience, but young people especially feel really anxious where their food is from, and it, in extreme cases, making people ill. And anxiety doesn't help with food. We all need to eat, and you have to be in a, um, you have to, you, you can't be too anxious, you can't make good decisions. So this book isn't about making you more anxious. It's about giving you information so you can make better decisions. And so to conclude, um, just some, here is some, at least can just stay up here while Samantha and I um, have, a, have a conversation. But I think we can, you, you know, we know about eating less meat, but cut, cutting food waste, um, reducing plastic, eating local and seasonal where you can, eating fair trade, and I've got a few recipes in the book as well to try out with things like fava beans, you know, some of the, the plant proteins that we can eat that are so good for us. Um, but I'm, I hope I can make you less anxious and give you some information and knowledge um, about, about where our food comes from. Thanks. <laughs>
and and it's very personal as well food yeah, is very absolutely. personal to individuals yeah. so you can't simply tell them don't eat meat it's eat in something else instead so we have to make that choice and multi-pronged approaches are the best i think so um we have about half an hour um, so we invite questions. Let's sit down and take yeah. <laughs> but then don't ask, uh, wait for the question to speak um, for the mic. Once you get the mic, then you speak the, uh, the question. Um, can I have the, anyone willing to ask any questions? Yep, <laughs> Asha. Hi. Um, so um, I found it really interesting that you said that 100% of Welsh people use their compost bins. Yeah, yeah, the um, food so, waste bins. Yeah, yeah, so I'm from Wales, um, but and when I moved to Liverpool, um, there was like no way for me to um, separate my recycling. Like it all goes down the the same bin chute. Yeah. So how would you um, how do you explain that? Do you think it's it, in terms of the, in Wales, there's more of an infrastructure there to support people in making yeah, these decisions? Yeah, it, it does come back to councils and them having, um, you know, they, they sometimes, they have to spend a huge amount of money putting mm. infrastructure in place and they're often in um, contracts with huge companies for more than a decade mm. or, who, who are responsible for collecting the food waste, or to, for collecting waste. So it's hard for them to then shift. Mm -hmm. And I think... But I think there's something that we can do in that um, sometimes I think they're frightened. Councils are frightened of doing that because they're frightened that um, people will resist. Householders and voters, who they ultimately rely on, will refuse to put food waste in a separate bin. And I work for the Daily Telegraph. I've written articles about slot buckets, OK, and part of it. But, well, no, I've written balanced articles. You can use your mind. Mm -hmm. But basically... There is, there is a, um, a perception of a pushback against slot buckets because on a weekend like this, people say, well, there'll be flies around my slot bucket. And there'll be, when I say slot bucket, I mean a food waste bin. You know, there'll be flies, it smells. And that can happen. Mm -hmm. But you can deal with it, right? <laughs> and I, that's why I use Wales as a, as a comparison because so many people from Wales are like, well, it's just... Why? It, it, it feels gross, doesn't it, to put food waste into a bin when you know that it could be used for energy. It feels a bit strange well, in some ways. It doesn't for me because I've grown up doing it. Yeah, so, yeah. But... No, 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 I mean, it feels, way... sorry, to put it in the landfill bin. Oh, uh, right. You yeah. know, the opposite, you know, you understand. Yeah, so um, so I do, it is about, it is about long-term, the practicalities of long-term contracts with councils. But I think if they understood that people are willing and actually really keen for it to happen, they do it more often. And in some places, like um, there are places in East London where um, uh, estates, you know, like um, tower block estates, are setting up their own um, anaerobic digestion plants or compost mm -hmm. plants, yeah. Mm. Which, in some cases, you could argue, maybe because of transport, aren't having a huge effect on carbon, but if that's allowing yeah. them to have compost for community gardening and stuff, then there are other arguments that it's a good thing. Mm. Yeah, so just, I think it... That's why I put it in the book, because I, I try, you know, we need to get over the fear of um, food waste bins. <laughs> yeah, it you. essentially comes down to governance um, and yeah. decision making. Yeah, which people money, like. but it is long term, like, yeah. so it's like the recycling. could go on for quite a while, but recycling, like everyone's putting stuff in their recycling that can't be recycled because they want their council to recycle it. But you're not, you're just making, you're just, you're just contaminating the recycling so it goes to Turkey. That, like, don't put the wrong stuff in because your council is in a contract and they can't change overnight. Mm. So you, you've got to just... Yeah, but the changes can come if they think that's what voters want. Yeah. Thanks, Asha. Thank you. A, f <clears throat> a few years ago, I went round a bird-friendly farm that had won an award from the RSPB. Awesome. Whereabouts was it? Uh, near Rickle. Okay, which is okay, yeah, local yeah. here. I've done lots of that for my it was a, job. It was a great tour. And then yeah. the farmer started with peeling... An, he, he peeled an apple yes. to demonstrate how little... It's in the, the book. Yes, <laughs> how little <laughs> of the earth's surface farmer. is available uh -huh. for food. And at the end, I said, what were his crops? And it's a totally arable farm. And they were all uh, for beer and crisps. Yeah. Uh, no-one's recommending drinking more beer or eating more crisps mm -hmm. and or talks like this. 
the, the point is... I don't the, know, on a day like this. Yeah, <laughs> the, market is seem, the market is deciding what we're eating. Yeah, yeah. You might argue the consumer is a part of the market, but... Uh, I think it's a really good example. So, first of all, he is, he is a commodity farmer, but he is doing a lot for birds. Hmm. He's, he, 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 he or she is, is trying to bring wildlife back onto their farm, which wasn't happening for a few decades because people didn't understand that. And then in terms of big commodities, like that's why um, I've got a chapter on fava beans. So he, that's, another that's another commodity. He could start farming that. It's kind of got a... Uh, it's about systems thinking, which is a really huge thing to uh, consider. But um, perhaps we can make it worthwhile for that farmer to be growing fava beans, and then he can have, you know, a more diverse farm. But, but, he, but that's he, my he, point, you say. Yeah. We can make it worthwhile. Who's the we? Well, There's no government control going on here, is there? No, no. And ultimately, food policy is about government and bigger strings than us. Um, but I think that, you know, to feel completely powerless isn't going to do any good. So I do feel like you can... You can um, and it's nothing wrong with crisps and beer either you know like these are these are these are good these are uk crops which are a big part of the economy as well but i feel like um well in my book i feel like i'm, I'm trying to make an argument for uk uk um produced um plant proteins i give you recipes i tell you where to buy them that demand will hopefully uh then encourage a farmer to do that so i think there is things that consumers can do can I add something Limit, yeah. else to your uh, to yeah. his question? Um, so yes, the government makes policies. Food sector is really, really complex. Um, so the government does make policies, regulations, and all those things. But when it comes to what crops to grow, what varieties to grow, it's the big multinational companies who make that that decision. Even um, just like Even you had mentioned, an, an agronomist will visit the farmer and and make them deals, like you'll get the chemicals cheap, you'll get the seeds cheap. So, so these multinational so companies, uh, if you really look closer into them, you know, they are the ones who sell the seeds, they are the ones who make the pesticides, they are the ones who do the uh, fertilizers, for example, and they are the ones who make the choice as to what varieties needs to be grown. So for, exam for example, um, I don't know whether you've heard about the bouncing strawberries, Anyone? No. no. Um, they've come up with this bouncing strawberries because they are strawberries if it has to be transported from one end of the, the country to another end of the country, for example. Uh, in, during the process of transportation, they get bounced, they get damaged, and, you know, they, you, you won't sell them. You won't be able to sell them. So they have come up with this um, uh, strawberries. Now, these multinational companies, they've come up with this idea of creating this bouncy strawberries so they can hit the cartons here and there. Nothing will happen to them. They won't be damaged uh, because they have that ability to bounce like a ball. So they are looking at those kind of things. They're looking at shelf life, for example, when they choose a variety to be grown, be it potato, be it tomato, be it any crop, they're looking for the shelf life, the longer shelf life. So it may not be the tastiest of all. Bananas you talked about, yeah. you know, Cavendish is the only uh, variety they got. There are millions of uh, varieties across the globe, but they pick only that because they uh, they are quite hardy. Um, so it's them who decide what crops to be grown and what everybody has to, and that decides the market as well. And then obviously the farmer has to follow the market. And I could say to you, I believe if you what you need you need to grow your own fruit and vegetables. You need to come out of the food system, but I've can't say that in my book because I'm not out of it. So I never feel comfortable saying, you know, don't, well, don't drink crisps and beer, because you know, I do. You know, it's, it's hard to be part of a system and, yeah, find, uh, find ways to also push back against that system or have any power in it, isn't it? Um, Asha. Hello. Um, I was interested to hear what you were saying about um, plant protein. I, I thought 
there was a news headline relatively recently about soya bean production and the deforestation of um, in, in, around the Amazon. Yeah. Is, is, is that a thing? Is yeah, so that's one of the reasons why we should be planting more plant protein in this country, because oh. m m pretty much all the soybean grown in, the, the, it grown in the, um, South America now is genetically modified, and it's pretty much all for animal feed. But when you see, um, you know, soy milk and soy products for vegetarians and vegans, that's usually European, often organic. It, and it, so it's a bit of a red herring that people, you know, will attack a vegetarian or vegan and say, hey, well, you're eating GM soy. You're probably not. It's, it's the meat eater eating the GM soy via the chicken or the pig. So, um, so GM soy is really um, a meat eater's issue. And... I think, because the vast majority is, it, is, is going towards the um, meat industry. But a really good way of uh, pushing back against that is, um, is producing... So uh, the farmer that I interview in the book is growing faba beans for, for pigs and chickens. And um, in the UK, um, the National Farmers Union um, and uh, farmers in general are trying to push that more because they would like to produce feed for their own animals here. Obviously, it makes sense. And, but it's a great crop because it's fixing nitrogen in the soil um, if it's a legume. So, um, so that's a way we can sort of push back against um, uh, a, 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 a importing quite so much GM soy. Hi. You mentioned at the beginning about soil and the centrality yeah. of how important it is. And I um, go to local producers' food markets, yeah. in, well, locally to me in Tang Hall, where the farmers who bring in the, yeah. um, their crops are really worried about soil erosion. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, how many years have we got left? And they talk about um, the no-dig approach yes, because digging removes no nutrients from the soil, disturbs yeah. the soil greatly. I wonder if you've got any comments to make about yeah, no-dig and how, how um, it's seen by the government and farmers it, in general. It's got huge potential and a lot of um, uh, the news of buzzword is regenerative farming. <laughs> and a lot of farmers, um, regenerative e equals no-dig. It's actually not that simple because a lot of organic farmers would call themselves regenerative but they would plow because they don't have they will not use chemicals so a lot of no dig farming uses a lot of uses glyphosate but the soil is in a better condition because the the carbon's not released when you plow but then you still have to get rid of the weeds yeah with a chemical that they argue is less so it's a really interesting new argument because glyphosate has been the problem for so long but then it's been used quite a lot in it's only an intensive regenerative farming. So no dig, no dig is definitely, um, is, you're going to see it more because you can, you can produce food affordably and intensively for a big market. So it's a really great thing. But for example, potatoes, quite hard to grow potatoes without digging up the soil, but it is happening. Yeah. yeah. So, and people do it on their allotments. I, there's someone near me in an allotment who's got no dig allotment and it's, yeah, I it's do it. amazing. Yeah. I do that my yeah, 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 yeah. So I think, it, and it's about, of preserving carbon in the soil like it's really simple like carbon's a building block of us I wonder and how our much foods it's taught and at school really so it's like the future yeah of young people at school now yeah what do they get taught about well I don't I, I think, I think they are this. being taught about these things but then they're living in a world where you know they're also um, eating GM soy through their chicken yeah. and the, you know they're crisp but, but I think that the, the the really interesting thing about um, yeah, no dig. It's so you can get pretty passionate about it, aren't you? Yeah. Can't you? And then you yeah. sort of you're driving through the country, so you see someone ploughing, you're like, God, carbs have just been released. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. um, ploughing is also something that a lot of organic farmers rely on, and yeah, right. it's an ongoing yeah. conversation in the farming world. And I personally believe all the labels aren't necessarily that helpful. I yeah. think just farming is. Farmers are great. They're producing our food. Yeah. All farming should be regenerative. And a lot of that will be no dig because it works. Yeah. 
Hi, um, I had a question about uh, pet food. Oh, so right. it's I it's obviously I don't know much about it. Oh, <laughs> that was my question. How much do you know about pet food? So as part I mean, of the I food, I guess I know more from my first book because a lot of people are always going abattoir. You know, we should eat every part of the animal in the UK, and um, um, but you know, go to an abattoir. There's nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted because where there's brass, where there's muck, there's brass, isn't it? But where there's Anything. So when you go to an avatar, you know, you see piles of noses and anuses and all the rest of it. And that's what goes in your pet food. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's not going to waste, right? Yeah. So, but, that's, yeah. so that's a good I thing. I think there are. It's really interesting. There's a company called Lily's Kitchen, mm. which is now advertising that it, it can produce lower carbon pet food. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because a lot of people with pets are vegan, vegetarian. They're trying to cut their own diet. But obviously they have to... I think there are vegan pet foods, but they don't necessarily want to make their animal vegan. There are so some it's vegetarian dogs. Yeah, foods, yeah. Kitchen's but then they're really expensive brand as well. So these are kind of like niche. It's, brands, it's a it license. Really it's it's, it's going to make a lot of money. It's like ready meals, like a ready meal, a vegan lasagna. Ready meals cost the same as a beef lasagna. Believe me, it's a lot cheaper to make. You're making a lot of money out of it. I mean, yeah, buy shares. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like, yeah. It's a hard one because we love our pets, yeah. but it's like, you know, they do kill birds and eat meat. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? There. Asha. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment right back to the, um, the compost question at the start. Oh, yeah. And I've just moved back to York, and I lived in the US for 20 years, and um, I lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and San Francisco. And, and I say those two cities because, by any metric, they're very left-leaning, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. very right-on. And we couldn't get either city to give um, composting like Wales does, which is so, I find it remarkable that you could do that in Wales. Uh, what we did, though, just to prove your point about people power and, yeah. and talking to local government, we actually started paying a small amount to compost. Um, for us, it felt like it was a charitable donation, but we created an impetus so that um, the local, the, the, the city could see that there was money to be made um, through composting. Yeah. And so after a couple of years of us actually almost like funding it ourselves, the city did realise, and, and, and that's how we um, ended up getting composting in both of our cities um, in the same way that Wales so fantastically does. So yeah, I just wanted to say that as a, even in very kind of like loony left town, yeah. we still had to, um, you know, go to City Hall to get those things done. But it's a really nice story to hear because you can come out of these talks feeling slightly um, depressed <laughs> and, uh, and the food system is so huge but you that's quite that's an amazing example of people power and how passionate you can get about compost and dirt because you're like once you know you're like, oh, it's the answer to everything so good for you and on back on wales again i think it's um it's up there with taiwan on um on recycling food waste and the reason taiwan has to do that they have no landfill left and that that you know the uk has got a limited amount of landfill so there comes a point where it's not even about the environment, it's just about the fact we, we don't have any space left to bury it in the ground, so we have to deal with it. And they, they, they do a huge amount, they um, treat their food waste and feed it to pigs as well. That's something that happens much more commonly in the Far East. And part of that is because they don't have landfill, so they have to. And lots of people think we ought to be doing that in the UK. But, um, there are other ways, like through insect proteins as well, to be reusing it. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was a question. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello. Hi. Um, I want to uh, make a reflection about how um, how all all of these um, really necessary changes we need to make in terms of how we relate to food and to the land. Um, are um, as well and sometimes um, managed by class and accessibility. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, I want to talk my own experience. Uh, 20 years ago, I tried to live in an eco village myself, and it was a, a very difficult <laughs> experience because, of course, most of the people that were in the, this movements where people that came from a very rich 
background and were able to afford. No? So I think this type of conversation should come in this type of networks where we are talking about food, uh, because uh, how many people would like to be part of this but cannot afford? Uh, starting from the farmers, we see, um, I mean, uh, farmers that are not able to transition because they already the distribution networks of the farmers are uh, managed by mafias. I mean, I worked eight years in Mexico with indigenous okay, farmers, yeah. and the, and the main problem there was not only the change to do a regenerative work, but to to be able to sell in these big markets of Central de Abastos where they control the prices and they control everything and sometimes they can't even pay for the transport to get there, so they prefer for the food to rot them down. No? Yeah. Um, so you start from there and then you have other farmers that they say, okay, I want to do that. Uh, I've known people that were pioneers of the agroecology, organic farming now called regenerative uh, and they continuously struggled to distribute with these same systems. They had people from the distributors of the green, uh, you know, uh, in that case was the green corner in Mexico, or other places that are the big uh, companies that sell the organic, and they want, nearly want this uh, square a square watermelon, no? The same with the mm -hmm. lettuces with a <laughs> long shelf life. Mm. So um, these school, families, yeah. exactly, these families uh, and projects that uh, if there was a way to self-support within a set network of self-support could thrive, aren't able to thrive, and then big transnationals take over. So uh, there's a very inter interesting map that talks about the owners of the organic. And that's where you can see, you know, all of this. Uh, so are we really doing, uh, is it really changing? And that's why it's really interesting that both of this, well, you as the speaker, but as well the teacher talks about the integrative and systemic <coughs> approach to things. Um, I transformed my own frustration, no? of trying to grow my own food in an eco village into trying to work all those years until the mentor, the founder of the organization died, to work with the farmers. So then said, maybe I won't grow my food, but I'll support all these farmers, no? And then now living in York for five years, the only way I can grow my food is uh, in a small balcony and in my kitchen, you know? And it's not actually enough for me to... Yeah. So it's really nice, but it's as well very frustrating to say, um, well, now I discovered there's a community garden where I live. <laughs> so yeah, actually, yeah, I can't <coughs> cry so much about it. But what I'm trying to say is important when we talk in these conversations about buying organic, buying vegan, that for me, to be honest, has become uh, sort of a trend as well, you know, where where we have forgot the natural way people lived, like your grandfather's business, yeah. like the way in my own family uh, people ate the corn, the corn and the beans, no, yeah. as a staple, and only had a little bit of meat, and that still happens in the villages in Mexico. People have a bit of meat only mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of money, but it's the same. Is work in many indigenous communities where uh, you were only allowed to eat a certain amount of salmon for this family or a certain amount of, of these foods uh, on the certain season. So what I try to do right now myself is this exact mixture. No, I go to that uh, food circle. I think I've seen you there uh, on the Wednesdays, which is a, a very interesting food co-op because it doesn't go on to the extreme of we're organic, expensive, unaccessible. People like me that are lower working class, uh, I'm able to buy some of the things that I eat, some of them, and maybe I don't buy everything all the time there. At the same time, I go to a local international food store where I can get some of my foods, no? And at the same time, I go to the co-op, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> and get other things, you know? So, and, and not feel guilty. I think <laughs> this thing that you're touching is very important because on these 20 years I've been around the, this type of movement, I have encountered so many people dealing with 
the mental health around that and transferring that to their kids too. And the kids uh, even rebelling, no? Saying, yeah. look, mom, I'm drinking milk, or yeah. look, I'm eating meat, you know? So it's how do you make it? And the Bay Area, actually, is a very big example where I could see uh, projects that, um, I guess it still exist, the Fresh Farm Choice, I would recommend to check it out, where youth from uh, at-risk youth are uh, exposed to their different cultural foods, how to cook, how the food system goes. They go and buy it from the farmers, and they go there in uh, in the it's in Oakland, Oakland and Berkeley area, uh, with the ecology center, and they. They go to where the moms go and pick up the babies. So they, when they pick up their babies from work, they can buy fresh food in affordable prices. No, so those type of projects that offer those type of solutions where you have an accessibility for the people from the lowest income, I find them as the as 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 you know something I it's really passionate and it's really important to bring into these conversations. I agree, it's really important to bring the, um, the social aspect in and um, I um, spent five years on this book and I had to stop somewhere so I decided to keep it um, to make the environment my focus um, but I have tried to find stories like positive stories about places like um, Incredible Edible you know in Todd Morden um, and some of the, the the stories that you've mentioned to to, to illustrate how it could happen and also to talk about food banks and redistribution of food and I do think that the, I do think, and I'd like to actually write a supplementary chapter for my paperback, which I'm working on, um, because I do think it's really important, like you said, like access, food access, because um, they were previously called food deserts because people are a deprived income, but I think a better word is food swamps because you can actually get quite a lot of food. It's just not very good food. Um, and that's something that we, sh we need to address. So, yeah, I think access to fruit and veg is a really good question. You know, like we can talk about here about wanting to buy local and seasonal, but it's why I said if you can, because it's not possible for a lot of people, and that's something um, that's a government policy. You know, that's and that's about you know, like when a new when a new shopping centre um, is built, where's where, where are the food centres? The, the, you know, it, it, town planning can insist on on um, on on different kind of foods being available there, not just multinationals, things like that. So, yeah, I think um, it's a good, uh, it, the social aspect is definitely a part of it, certainly, yeah. Can I just comment that? Yeah. All new builds, all new build housing, flats, houses, yeah. whatever, should, should have um, an element for growing food. Yeah, and there, there, is, there is an academic at Sheffield University who yeah. is pushing that. Her name's, her name, her name's Jill it. Edmondson. And that's where it comes from. It does come from like a a academics, you know, making the case and putting it to policymakers. So it is happening. Look her up, Jill so Edmondson. So. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other questions? Another five minutes. Ac academics like the mafia, who is also, you know, yeah. making arguments Asha. that makes, you know, that, that address some of these issues. Thank you. Do we just have to? accept that we have to pay considerably more for the food that we eat and cheap food has got to be a thing of the past? Um, that's a really good question. In my last book, I felt very confident to say you need to spend more on meat because um, you can make meat go further and you don't need a lot of it. And I, But I cannot say in my position, to go back to that lady's comments, I'll spend more on your fruit and vegetables because um, people are struggling. Um, in the current uh, cost of living crisis to get enough fruit and veg for their kids. In um, East London at the moment, there is a, there is a uh, uh, people are, are getting prescriptions so that they can buy fruit and vegetables because that's what's affecting their health. So I feel, I feel with fruit and veg, um, I can't, no, I can't say like we should spend more on fruit and veg. Um, I feel like we should be um, addressing issues of poverty first, and then, and then, and then you talk about like the balancing out. Intensive farming. Yeah. Farmers having to squeeze, you know, having to use fertilizers, having to do practices which 
possibly they don't want to do. I just don't think I just don't think I can sort of like talk about the the answer being spending more fruit and veg when it, when we have a society at the moment where people aren't able to spend aren't able to buy um, nutritious fruit and vegetables. So I feel like then the question is like, how is our society designed? So we, you know, housing is so expensive. You know, the debates about that um, r rather than um, yeah and. Because otherwise, I'm a I'm a affluent person saying spend more on fruit and veg, you know, and I just don't feel comfortable saying that because it's all right for me. Um, but as a proportion of our income, I think we now spend I think it's as low as ten percent, and um, you know, fifty years ago it was it was much higher proportion of our income, and that made us appreciate food more as well. Um, and farmer, yeah, how we, yeah, I think, I think it's, some, it's something to consider as part of a wider, um, a, a, a wider economy questions, I think, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, lots of some really interesting questions and thank you very much, Louise, for Hi. fielding all those questions and answering them. Um, and thank you all to all of you for attending and you know it was an engage and I'm sure you'll agree that it was an engaging presentation um, Louise will be available uh, downstairs if you would like to grab a copy of this uh, book um, avocado anxiety uh, this is being offered by one of the independent booksellers Fox Lane books um, so if you'd like to have a signed copy <laughs> Louise is available downstairs so thank you once again very much for your, uh, you know, coming here to attend the session, and thank you, Louis. Thank Great. you. Well,